So I decided to take a break from the Book of Mormon for a little while just because I needed a break from the Book of Mormon. And I decided to give Mission Earth, Volume 1, The Invader's Plan by L. Ron Hubbard a chance. Just because everything that I have ever read about Mission Earth has stated that it is one of the worst sci-fi series ever read. And uh, if you guys know anything about L. Ron Hubbard, you know that there's probably some truth to that claim, but I figured, can it really be that bad? Yes, yes, it, it can be that bad. It, it's, it's bad in ways that goes beyond a bad novel. It's bad in ways that are perplexing. Like, you're reading it, and you have no idea what was going through his head when he was doing this stuff. But it's it's such an interesting book, and I love the fact I got this off Amazon for a penny. The Kindle version is five bucks. Don't buy it. If you're going to get this book, get it for a penny, because that's probably what it's worth. Um, that and the fact that the book itself did not survive the reading. It broken half as soon as I got halfway through and this thing was clean when I got it I believe this is the original uh, I think this is the original version at least the paperback version I know there was you know hard cover hard cover release um, this was probably published in 1985 I believe let me look yeah 1985 so it's old as dirt but I mean really I, this thing was absolutely perfect when I got it fantastic condition but um I've reviewed Battlefield Earth and Battlefield Earth was fun in a bad way, like, you guys ever seen Troll 2? That's a bad movie, but it's very enjoyable. You can sit down and you can get some popcorn and you can have some fun with that movie. And Battlefield Earth is kind of the same way. It's wretchedly long, but, you know, it, it has its moments. You, you, and if you just suspend logic for a few minutes, it's, it's, it's a fun ride. This thing is really frustrating. Um, and uh, it's amazing because... It's just the sheer size of the damn thing. It's ten volumes. They invented a word, decaology, for the, just the sheer... And listen listen to these titles. I find these amazing. Um, volume 1, The Invader's Plan. That's what I've read. Black Genesis, The Fortress of Evil. Sounds like a Flash Gordon short or something. The Enemy Within, An Alien Affair. Fortune of Fear, Death Quest. Voyage of Vengeance, Disaster, Villainy Victorious, and The Doomed Planet. I mean, they're kind of cool titles. They, I, they made me... I was kind of expecting this kind of fun pulp writing that's just awful, but it's writing basically generated for entertainment, right? Well, yeah, he tried. He tried. Uh, let me give you a brief synopsis of the plot. Yeah, there are going to be plot spoilers here, but, I mean, there's ten more books I have to read. I haven't made, I haven't decided if I'm going to do this yet. I would like to have them, but I just I'm just not sure if I can get through this series. It, it'll be worth a shot. But anyway, here's the basic plot, at least in the Invaders Plan. You have this galactic imperial planet Voltar. Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant Voltar. Um, it's uh they're conquering their way to the center of the galaxy, and um, turns out Earth is on their trajectory, right? And at some point, they're going to conquer Earth. They're aware of its existence. It's called Bleedo P3. Anyway. Um, uh, yeah, the names in this are going to take you for a ride. But anyway, Earth is in the way. They're going to conquer it. It's actually an important stepping stone for the Voltarian Confederacy to reach the center of the galaxy. they got to conquer Bleedo P3. And um, turns out this hotshot pilot named Jetero Heller I want Jetero to die, by the way. Um, Jetero Heller discovers that, and keep in mind, this was written in 1985, um, we humans are destroying our planet. We are pumping poisons into the atmosphere, we're destroying the ecosystem, and in no time at all, Earth's atmosphere will be uninhabitable. This is unacceptable for the Voltarian Confederacy, right? Because they have to use Earth as a base, a midway base. So, um... They, there's a big panic attack, and they set up this whole clandestine operation to help uh, facilitate the invasion, I guess. They actually send Jetero Heller to Earth to introduce technologies that will help slow down global warming to preserve the planet so it can be conquered later. 
Okay, so we already have an incredibly stupid plot, right? Why don't you just conquer it? I don't know. It's it, Suspend logic, okay? Suspend logic. Anyway, Hubbard isn't happy with just this plot, though. Voltar's government, and you see this over and over again in his literature. It was really, really heavy in Battlefield Earth as well. He's obsessed with, bureaucr with bureaucracies, and bureaucracies are one of the cornerstones of his fiction every time he's got to have a complex bureaucracy because apparently he thought this was interesting. Yeah, he thought bureaucracy was interesting to write about, and I'll give him credit. Sometimes rarely it gets intriguing because of the plotting and the betrayals and all that, but most of the time he's writing about bureaucracy. So in this bureaucracy there is this secret clandestine organization known as the Apparatus. The Apparatus is charged with doing all of the secret work, getting rid of dissenters, um, all the dirty work that the government want, doesn't want anybody to know about. Um, in a lot of the reviews for Mission Earth, the apparatus is compared to the CIA. <clears throat> One of the things that makes Mission Earth really different is that it was supposed to have been written as satire. He's got this long-winded introduction. The word satire originated in this point in time and has been used by these authors at these periods of time and blah, 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 blah. It's, oh, God, it's long-winded. and I mean, I do appreciate that he's trying to play with genre a little bit, but let me, let me actually read the last few sentences of this because when I, when I read it, I laughed out loud because I don't... I just don't even know how to react to this. Uh, Esther, he gives you the whole history of the word satire and basically kind of warning you that there's a lot of me poking fun of the government in here. Listen to this. So I hope you find this satura very edible, though I'm sure certain individuals and institutions will charge that this bowl of fruit has sharp seeds. Bon appetit. I want to punch him in the face. He's so snide. <laughs> anyway, um, so yes, he's making fun of the CIA in this novel, but he does it really, really badly because for a huge chunk of this novel, nothing happens because the main character is Sultan Grizz, and Sultan Grizz is charged in the apparatus with derailing this plot to save Earth. And it takes forever to explain why they, the, the apparatus wants this mission to fail. Because they're trying to set up some type of coup to overthrow the Voltarian Confederacy. So they don't want the conquering of Earth to go forward as planned. The poisoning of the atmosphere somehow plays into their kind of their, their coup d'etat, I don't know. Not a lot is explained here, and you have to read the whole damn book in order to figure out why this is even occurring. It doesn't even explain anything to you. For most of the book, you're following Sultan Gree, or Grizz, however the heck you pronounce it, and he's trying to frustrate Jetter O'Heller, trying to derail his attempt to um, go to Earth and save it, and it's literally, they never leave Voltaire. They're sitting around twiddling their thumbs. They're playing with working on a spaceship. There's all these betrayals. There's literal mindless plot filler. Nothing happens. You literally could have skipped this whole novel. Could have just skipped everything and instead just put him on the ship, blast him in the outer space and started with book two. It's obvious. He just wrote this so he'd have a huge like delay to fill up his freaking decaology. It is a nightmare because you're just stuck in a freaking apartment for half of the novel. You never did. Gosh, it's boring and it's lame and I'm just sitting here like, why am I still reading this? Um... Now, he, I, I don't even have to go into the plot, because there is no plot. This is a jumbled mess that he is delaying to drag this out into his fancy decaology, and it's so obvious. But anyway, let me get to the, my favorite part of these novels, and this happens in every single one of the, everything I've ever read by him. I hate his characters. Hate his characters. Like, if you remember my Battlefield Earth review, I talked about, what was what the heck was his name, Biddy MacLeod? He's supposed to be this young, naive fighter in the resistance against the Cyclos. He dies. 
and it's supposed to be this this funeral scene, the funeral of Biddy MacLeod, and his lover is so distraught that she like throws herself into the grave, and it's so obvious he wanted this to be like a serious scene. He wanted he wanted your heart to break, and I'm dying laughing because it's, it is the this the syrupiest just trite garbage that he's just like it's so terrible that this person has died and i was happy he was dead because i found him that irritating now i want every single character in this book to die i hate them all hate them all especially the main character he's a coward he's he's a wimp he's an idiot and i'm like can we please kill this guy off so i don't have to hear his bullcrap anymore but even sultan gree is more tolerable than Jetro Heller, the kind of de facto hero of the novel, even though he's not, we're not hearing it from his perspective, because Jetro Heller is a very special kind of irritating. Jetro Heller is kind of like the basketball star at your high school that everyone loved, and he could do no wrong, and everywhere he went, people were just like, hey, yeah, man, you're awesome. Magnify that times a thousand. Imagine your high school is the entire planet, and everyone knows who he is, and he's this huge celebrity, and he's done all these, like, feats of superhuman heroism. He's, he's like a pilot in the fleet. He's a major sports star. He's brilliant. And everyone's just like, Oh, Cheddar O'Hello, you're so cool! Like, someone kill this guy! I hate him so much! Ugh, maybe I'm dealing with some... Maybe I'm dealing with some high school issues here. But there is literally nothing about any of the characters that I give a half crap about. It's frightening to me that a writer could sell this many books and be this bad at it. Like, I want to buy the rest of them just because I can't believe they exist. It's just perplexing. I mean, there's nothing pleasant at all about this book. I mean, I would literally just be sitting in my chair reading it, and I'm like, why the hell am I doing this to myself? And it's, it's because... I'm just so overwhelmed by the pure fermented atrocity of this writing. And here's the thing. like, Here's what's actually kind of cool. A friend and I once had this big experiment with coffee. And I swear this connects. Just hang on a second. We drank Starbucks. Yeah, we were those people. We drank Starbucks like at least three times a week. I don't look I look back on myself and I'm like, what the heck? Anyway, there was so much money down the drain. But anyway, we were hooked on Starbucks coffee. And one day we were we were driving around, and we didn't have much cash. So we stop at a gas station and we get this really crappy ninety nine cent coffee. And it was really, really strange that we actually really enjoyed that coffee because it was it was like just pure sugar and pure cream. There was no strength to it, and it was like it was like drinking candy or something. It was almost addictive. Well, I know this really flips the metaphor, but imagine if you were on crap coffee for like a year and then you had a cup of Starbucks. Well, you can actually do something really similar with this book. I read this book and I read this book and I read this book, and I knew I was reading garbage. Well, then I picked up Philip K. Dick, and I read The Crawlers. Very short story. It was like taking a bite out of like the fanciest steak you can imagine after you've been eating like crystal hamburgers for a year. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. And then I read just a page of Terry Pratchett's Guards, Guards, and I was like, the craft. The, the care, the love that has gone into this writing, it was, like, it, was, it was like drinking fine wine, except it was coming from the words I was saying as I read it out loud. I was like, it's just so full, so brilliant. I love these writers. And then I open up friggin' Mission Earth again, and it's just a shower of mediocrity and horror. And now I appreciate everyone else so much more because I never want to go back to this. And yet, yeah, I'm going to order the next volume because I hate myself. Stay away from Mission Earth. In its badness, it is addictive because I want to see 
how bad it will get. I'm only scratching the surface here, people. Let me leave off on this note. The badness is so full that it not only offends your sense of aesthetics, but it also offends your sense of ethics. It is misogynistic. It is, it is homophobic. It takes a stance on homosexuality that is just so decrepit and ah, the sex scenes in here, and yes, there are sex scenes, will make you genuinely less interested in sex because of how badly written they are and how stupid they are. I mean, it's amazing. I should just read a chapter to you. I think I might. If you want me to read a section of Mission Earth just so you can hear how bad the dialogue is, just so you can hear how stupid the wording is, let me know. Because I'm not going to do it unless you want it. Because you got to beg for torture like that. You have to seek it out, and you have to ask for it. Because I paid my penny, and I got so much more than I bargained for. Thank you. I love you all.